1967, my second year in the league. I played four games and five nights in four different cities, and one of them was the All-Star game. We played on Thursday night, we played on Friday night, flew to San Francisco for the All-Star game on Saturday, went to a banquet that night, played the All-Star game Sunday afternoon, and played the next night in some other place. I was the second player picked in the draft in 1965, and they offered me $12,500, and I had to make the team. So yeah, it's a totally different world. But the NBA—it's the only time—it's the only time I ever kicked your ass. They paid me thirty-six. See, there you go. Mike was and I, I was picked 99th in the draft. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the lowest-paid guy in the league this year will make more money than I ever made in my best year of playing. The problem with the game today for me is that it's all off the dribble. Mike and I were talking about this. When you're dribbling the basketball, you are not anywhere nearly as effective as you could be as an offensive player to help your teammates and create opportunities. Because if you dribble the ball and your man is smart enough to make a back cut because his guy turns his head, how are you going to pass the ball to him? You only have the ball in your hand because you're dribbling it. But if you're standing there facing your guy and seeing how he plays you, anything that happens, you can react to it immediately and make a pass. And so nobody learns how to play the game now facing up like this seeing what happens and using his first dribble as a productive dribble to get even or past this guy and get into the defensive gut and create problems for the team. And so that's part of the game is kind of disappearing a lot. Uh, very few players do that. You watch a game and it's dribble, 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 dribble. And if guys would learn how to do that facing up, read this guy and learn how to beat him that way, teams could be way more productive. And that's how the kind of the game has changed. The effectiveness of the guys today they're like Greek gods. I mean, the bodies that they have, and they have strength coaches, they have agility coaches, they have dietitians, they have everybody, everything in the world going for them. Unlike Rick, I wasn't tall, I wasn't athletic. You know, he, he, he says he wasn't all those things, but he, you know, he was one of the most athletic, fastest guys that you could ever play with, as, long as, as well as being a great shooter and a great mind. He, he said he's not a great shooter in terms of the, he, he's a better scorer than he was a shooter, but I, I've seen Rick Barry knock down nine three pointers in a game. But the thing that I love playing about him so much was that when I would get in a game with him, I, would, I know I'm going to get one or two easy layups a game off of back doors of just having a guy that could read a situation, understanding it, just by eye contact, setting a guy up and making a, you know, making a good cut. But for me, teaching our players, the first thing I do is like, you cannot dribble. Why would you ever dribble the basketball without knowing what you're going to do with it? You, you have a dribble to use like when you're pressured. I use the fact that I can dribble to jab step a guy to create space for myself to be able to get my shot off. The last thing I want to do is give that away. That's the only weapon of value that I have. My last two years, I was over 94% accuracy. In fact, I laughed last season. Andre, Dr uh, Andre, what is it? Uh, yeah, Andre Drummond from the Pistons missed more free throws in one game than I missed my entire last two seasons. <laughs> He missed 23 free throws in one freaking game. If I were king for a day uh, and I could make the rule, I would, I would tell you that I would allow kids to come out of high school and play in the NBA. Um, and I would say to you that nobody has the right uh, to stop somebody from working and making the amount of money they could possibly make uh, at that period of time. Uh, I always looked at it this way. If you're good enough or smart enough to trick NBA guys into picking you and paying you, you know, who should, who should be able to stop that, okay? Uh, but I would say that uh, anybody that would be picked, you know, could go, uh, particularly for, uh, like first round. But after that, I would say you have to stay, you need to stay in school a couple of years. So like, it, so basically it's either you go out of high school or you gotta stay for two years uh, at the college level uh, because you weren't good enough to, to make it to the NBA at that point in time, and now, now you have to stay, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to benefit you. The coaching you're going to get is going to help you when you get to the next level. I, I think it's bad for the game, uh, but I, I understand where Mike's coming from in that regard. However, I do think that the laws are such that if the collective bargaining agreement, if you have a, something that's agreed to by both sides, uh, then it could, uh, it could be put in. It was four years after your high school graduation when I came out, I think it's important to do that. I think these kids need to get an education. Um, they're abusing it now. I know for a fact that some guys go off to school, know they're going to be a projected lottery pick after one year. 
they go to class and take these Mickey Mouse courses for the first semester to stay eligible, and then they don't even go to class in the second semester. It really hurts the game. Most, the majority of these guys, there's very few LeBron James in the world who come out and have an impact immediately in the game. And so many of these guys make the decision to leave, and they don't make it, and they screw their life up. It really is it's sad to see, but I understand that in a lot of cases it's an amazing thing. It changes their whole family dynamic, the money that's available is being made to them.